Our next speaker is Professor Andrea Donese, who's Professor of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, um, who's our most recently promoted individual within the department. Um, so we don't, not all of our documents reflect um, Andrea's elevated status. And Andrea is going to talk to us about the hidden wounds of childhood trauma. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, and yeah, it's a pleasure to, to be here to tell you um, a little about our work on um, childhood trauma. Uh, childhood trauma is arguably the most common um, preventable <coughs> risk factor for psychopathology across the life course. Um, and uh, my team, therefore, has been very interested in studying traumatic experiences in children uh, to promote new ways in which we can um, add to prevention, assessment, and treatment of children. Um, now, what do we um, mean when we talk about childhood trauma? Um, childhood trauma include experiences of victimization, such as abuse <coughs> by adults um, and bullying by peers, as well as other very distressing um, experiences that children have where they might feel that they, um, their um, survival or their physical integrity is threatened. As such, um, childhood trauma is a, a, an obviously overt um, insult and deviation from the expected environment that children live in. Um, and has been something that has been studied really since the um, beginning of our disciplines of uh, psychology and psychiatry. Now, because of the overt nature of childhood trauma and the long history in study childhood, um, childhood trauma, uh, people very often make the assumption that we know much about the effect of childhood trauma on psychopathology and health more generally, um, on the mechanisms that underlie these um, effects of um, childhood trauma on health and uh, on ways in which we can deliver treatment to the children who need it. Um, what I will argue today um, instead is that there is much that we need to discover uh, that remains still hidden from us and this is hampering the um, work that we can do to prevent, assess and treat um, children. Um, what we also want to think about is that we are probably at a very good time and we can brace for groundbreaking discoveries in this area. And I wanted um, with this talk to really highlight some of the resources that we can tap onto and that we have been tapping onto um, to just do that. So to begin with, for example, um, we know that um, the association between childhood, childhood trauma and psychopathology over the life course has been discussed and much has been said uh, about the uh, association between childhood trauma and psychopathology. Um, however, many of the studies that have looked at these associations have been based on um, small samples, samples that are not really representative of the overall population, um, with designs that do not allow us to separate the effects of childhood trauma from the effect of other things that happen to children who experience trauma, such as uh, perhaps maladaptive impairment. Uh, parental psychopathology or poverty. And finally, many of these studies have really focused on specific um, clinical questions, narrowing it down uh, to very particular diagnosis and uh, clinical concerns. Uh, what we can do um, to improve that is really capitalize on the um, incredible resources that we have um, in the Department of Child Psychiatry and the CAG more generally. For example, on some of the best cohorts worldwide that can be used to ask these kind of questions. This is one example. This is the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Study, which is a longitudinal study of 1,000 children born in Dunedin, uh, New Zealand, in 1972-73. Um, this sample has been followed since their birth to um, now age 45, we're just completing age 45 in the needle. And as you can see, the retention at the last uh, completed follow-up was 95%. So 95% of the children who were initially entered in the study are still seen many, many years after 
the onset of the study. And this is important because what happened very often in these large uh, epidemiological studies is that we are progressively going to lose the people that we actually are interested in studying. And so looking at just this number really is a testimony of how important this kind of study might be to look at developmental psychopathology. Uh, the assessment um, of victimization, importantly, has been done prospectively. So information on exposure to victimization and other traumatic experiences have been done as children and young people grew up. And therefore, we have a more objective way, if you like, of thinking about their exposure to these experiences rather than simply relying on retrospective report, which we now discover um, are a poor representation of the actual experiences that we can have uh, measured by a prospective um, um, assessment. In addition, um, there has been a very comprehensive uh, assessment and repeated assessment of psychological as well as physical health that allow us to really have a broad and comprehensive picture of the effects of childhood trauma um, on mental and physical health. Another resource that we have is the IRIS longitudinal twin study. Uh, this is instead a, a cohort of 2,000 twins uh, that were born in England and Wales in 1994 and 95. And in this case, the last assessment you see um, there was at age 18, but even in this case at age 18, we still have a retention of 93% of the original cohort. Again, highlighting the uh, rigor uh, that, um, of the research and the information that we can capture doing research on these important samples. Again, the assessment of, perspective of uh, um, childhood trauma and victimization has been carried out prospectively giving us uh, a greater understanding of what the actual exposure to traumatic experiences might be. And again, the comprehensive um, and repeated assessment of psychological and physical um, health outcome allow us to have a comprehensive uh, understanding of the effects of childhood trauma. So what did we do with this? I will just give you one example. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the association of childhood trauma and psychopathology. As I said, very often this association is discussed related to specific diagnosis. What we have done here at age 18 is comprehensively thinking not only at the diagnosis, but at symptom levels and aggregating symptoms from clinical interviews with these children in different classes of disorder, including internalizing disorders, so emotional disorders, um, externalizing or behavioral disorder and thought disorder that tap onto um, uh, psychotic um, um, symptoms. What you can see is that for increasing levels of, poly of victimization, we have increased not only in internalizing or in externalizing or thought disorder, but in all of them. So what we also have done here is putting together um, the uh, variation for these symptoms in emotional, behavioral, and thought disorder to see that overall the extent of polyvictimization is associated with a general increase in the risk for psychopathology. So it's none of the <coughs> diagnosis that we might think of, but is a global measure of psychopathology. And this is really important because what we see in the clinic, of course, is that psychopathology that is associated with childhood trauma also defines um, uh, diagnostic uh, criteria and threshold. And so it's really important that we are very broad and comprehensive the kind of assessment and treatment that we then uh, provide. Importantly, these effects persist when we adjust, given the, nature, the, the twin nature, the twin design of the study, when we adjust for uh, genetic as well as uh, important familial um, uh, contribution to this. And therefore, we are getting closer to be more confident in a causal effect of childhood trauma on these broad types of psychopathology. Childhood trauma does not only affect the incidence of psychopathology, but might also affect the course of psychopathology as well as the response to treatment. What you see here is a meta-analysis of different clinical trials that have looked at the predictive value um, of childhood trauma on outcome of treatment. You see the blue boxes are single effect sizes from each of the studies listed here on the left hand side. The lines are just the errors for those estimates and the red diamonds are the cum uh, cumulative effect sizes for the analysis. 
I'll draw your attention to the very bottom of the picture where that uh, red diamond tells us that um, individuals, so in this case depressed individuals with a history, so reporting a history of childhood uh, maltreatment, are more likely to show poor treatment response to any type of um, treatment that we could provide. Dividing up um, uh, in terms of the type of treatment that we're looking at here, you see that psychotherapy uh, actually achieves uh, broadly the same effects in those depressed individuals who have or have not a history of maltreatment. Psychopharmacology on its own um, has a slightly worse outcome in those individuals with a history of childhood maltreatment, uh, but combined therapy, which as many of you will know, is the kind of treatment we use generally for the more severe and demanding cases of depression, is actually the kind of treatment that has uh, a greater divide between depressed individuals with and without a history of maltreatment, where those with a history of maltreatment are nearly twice as likely to have poor treatment response. And this really highlights the importance of thinking about new ways in which we can help uh, these individuals. Now, I have been focusing, of course, here on mental health um, effects and consequences of childhood trauma, but uh, perhaps one of the most um, um, hotly investigated uh, um, area is the effect of childhood trauma on physical health. And I just wanted to raise this um, in the context of a big um, uh, um, um, review and scientific statement uh, we have contributed to um, the American Heart Association that really pulls together the evidence for a potential effect of childhood trauma, not only on mental health, but on very important cardiometabolic outcomes that are know will be very important in adult life, and we know in adult life are very much comorbid with depression, for example. Now, this is about the effects. So the effects are much broader, uh, but we need to study them rigorously to be able to draw causal inferences. Uh, what about the mechanisms? Well, in terms of the mechanisms, of course, um, we know that much research has been done on psychological and cognitive mechanisms that might underlie the effects of, co of uh, uh, childhood trauma on psychopathology. What we're particularly interested in as well is uh, to think about biological effects um, in terms of thinking about stress-sensitive systems that may mechanistically link uh, the exposure to childhood trauma and then mental and physical health outcomes. Um, this is uh, uh, something that we can do here, partly because in the context of the Institute, we have very advanced laboratory that allow us, uh, or at least give us the potential, to investigate this kind of biomarkers from clinical and epidemiological samples. And uh, one system that I've been very interested in um, is the immune system. The immune system, you will probably know it because it has been very involved in physical um, uh, trauma, but uh, it can also be triggered and activated by uh, psychosocial trauma. So what happens in condition of acute um, psychosocial stress uh, is that uh, because of the activation of the amygdala, we have an activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which then drives activation of secondary messengers in immune cells, which can then and in, induce an activation of the inflammatory response. Uh, we also have inhibitory mechanisms that are meant to be switching off the inflammatory response when this is no longer needed. And uh, what we know is that in um, adults with a history of childhood trauma, uh, this inhibitory response is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, limited. Therefore, Based on this, we have looked at the association between childhood trauma and varied um, uh, inflammatory biomarkers and found that uh, adults, as well as children in some cases, with a history of childhood trauma show increased levels uh, of inflammation. And we look at this uh, inflammation biomarker as a way, of course, of reversing the effects of childhood trauma on psychopathology. Because if it's true that childhood trauma is linked to inflammation, and much evidence now suggests inflammation is related to psychopathology, then we can, by inhibiting the effect of childhood trauma on inflammation, we might be able to prevent the effect of trauma on later health outcomes. 
Um, I want to finish by um, highlighting a, 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 an important area, which is that, of course, we are here at the Institute of Psychiatry and Mosley, and we are leaders worldwide in thinking about effective treatments that can be delivered to help people with mental health conditions. Uh, particularly in our clinic, we have developed um, evidence-based treatment that are now recognized in different guidelines. But what is important to recognize is that, of course, we can treat children who come to our clinic. And what we're seeing is that very few of the, of the kids who have been exposed to trauma have any contacts with mental health professionals. And even children who develop psychopathology, impairing psychopathology such as PTSD, are ending up having contact with uh, mental health professionals. So what we need to do is not only to think about efficacy of our treatments, but think about effectiveness and understand how we can bring children who need treatment to the, our clinic. To do so, we have been active in uh, delivering various um, uh, initiative, uh, educational initiatives, including MindEd and most recently uh, a collection of um, uh, information on trauma for um, ACAM. Um, at the same time, we need to recognize that um, although we are clinicians, we need to think more broadly and we need to be contributing to initiatives to the public health in terms of, as we have done in the, in the past, uh, planning and advising and delivering public health strategies for the screening and treatment, for example, uh, as we have done, of uh, victims of the terrorist attack in Seuss, Manchester bombing, Grenfell Tower, and London attacks. So these are all incidents that, of course, bring on a lot of trauma, and we need to think broadly, not simply as clinicians in our clinic, but what is the contribution that we can give to the society as leader in this area to bring children who need to have the uh, e efficacious treatment that we can deliver. Uh, so I'll stop here saying that much needs to be done to uncover the hidden wounds of childhood trauma, and I think, as I said, we are really needed to um, uh, uh, raise to the challenge and deliver this. Thank you very much.